In this episode, I'm very excited to have the newspaper reporter who was able to get an interview no other journalist was able to secure, and that is O.J. Simpson. Hi, everyone. I'm XTV producer Jennifer Moore, and with me right now is Tim Graham of the Buffalo News. And Tim recently got some, some notoriety for an interview he did with O.J. Simpson. And that was about what, Tim, that was the first significant interview he's done in quite some time. Yeah, that was uh, about 10 years, uh, I think. And it's because he was in prison for nine and um, he had been out for six or seven months at the time of the interview. And then for the trial, uh, he wasn't doing any interviews then. So uh, maybe even 11, maybe 12 years, uh, I'm just taking a guess. So from just to be safe uh, in the Story. I said it was his first interview in at least 10 years. Wow, that's incredible. So I want to walk people back a little bit. You've been working at the Buffalo News for, for several years. Um, what kind of background do you have in journalism? Well, you know, I'm a self-taught journalist in many ways. Um, I went to Baldwin Wallace College, which is on the west side of Cleveland. I'm a native and you don't even have a journalism program. So I went there to study sports management, and my goal was to work for a team. And the Cleveland Browns at the time actually had their training facility right on the Baldwin-Wallace campus. So my thinking was I can go to Baldwin-Wallace, study sports management, maybe get an internship at the Browns or something like that, and it would be a great place to get started in this to stay in sports for as long as I could. I didn't have the, the skills to cut it, uh, so as an athlete, that is, and, uh, started working for the college paper and fell in love with it. And that was during my freshman year. And, uh, I started taking jobs wherever I could covering high school sports. And my first assignment actually was, uh, for a paid, paid gig at a real newspaper was covering a coach pitch, a, a baseball tournament, a six-year-old kids. Uh, for 25 bucks. And I think I probably averaged out to about a dollar 12 an hour or something that day because uh, it was an all day tournament deal. And I just put in way too much work on it. But um, anyways, that's how I got started. And I bounced around the country and uh, was in Las Vegas for about five years before coming to Buffalo the first time in 2000. And then uh, just constantly moving up the ladder, bigger responsibilities, a bigger paper, um, bigger circulations, uh, always just kind of taking the next step uh, in, in my career, trying to uh, further myself that way. And um, came to Buffalo in 2000, left in 2007 to cover the NFL for the first time uh, for the Palm Beach Post. I'd covered the NHL prior to that for seven years, the Buffalo Sabres. And uh, then was at ESPN for three years. And Moved back to Buffalo because ESPN didn't care where I lived. So, so I moved to Buffalo twice, Jennifer. Once from Las Vegas and once from Fort Lauderdale. You moved to Buffalo by choice. So let's make twice. that now. Twice, yeah. It's uh, it's the inverse of what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to do uh, move out of Buffalo into warmer uh, climates. But love it here. It's where I want to raise my family, and um, been back in the Buffalo News since 2011. Wow. Okay, so back in the 90s when all of this was going down with OJ being on trial and the double murders, at the time, like, where were you and did you ever think that you would have a connection to that story? No way. And even you could have asked me this question two months ago and I would have said, no way. It just didn't seem right or just didn't seem plausible to me. But when the Bronco chase, I remember it vividly where I was, as a lot of people do. Uh, I was uh, sitting on my couch in the Boston area. I was working for a brief period of time uh, at, with the Boston Herald in their sports department. Um, had a cup of coffee with them before uh, taking a different job as an assistant sports editor somewhere else back in Ohio. And uh, I just remember watching it and the whole thing. And I remember where I was when the verdict came in. I was by this time working in Las Vegas. And when uh, the jury found him not guilty of the uh, two murders, you know, it was these things that are indelible and major, major news occurrences. And uh, no, never in my life would I have thought about it. And um, it just goes back to a conversation I was having with the Bills running back with Sean McCoy about running in the snow. It was a story about how you know, he was coming off this 
this great game against the Indianapolis Colts in overtime in which a ton of snow fell in, uh, in Orchard Park. And it was a picturesque game. It was like a Courier and Ives football game. You know, it was just gorgeous. And um, so a lot of people may remember it from seeing the highlights because I think it was on mainstream news. I get the, the A block of newscasts around the country of like how much snow these teams are playing in. And so LaShawn McCoy has a penchant for running well in snow games and some running backs can't do it. And so I was talking to him about it and it came up that one of the great running backs in the snow considered to be, you know, by historians, uh, the best maybe is OJ Simpson. And so I was talking to LaShawn, who also played for the Buffalo Bills. So I'm talking to LaShawn McCoy about it. And he said, well, what did OJ say about running in the snow? And I laughed and I said, like, yeah, we don't know. OJ doesn't do interviews. And he just deadpanned. I don't think his naivete. I don't know. But he said, well, why doesn't he? Why not? Why doesn't he do interviews? Does he, do you think he's and too I, young to kind of remember? No, he knew. I, well, I don't know. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. You know, these guys, they're immersed in their world. And athletes, I think a lot of us assume, they're the people that we cover in any walk of life. We assume that they know what we know because we're you know, I, I'm in this profession profession because at one point in my life, I was a big sports geek and I had all the cards, uh, you know, the trading cards and the encyclopedias. And I was just going through it, the trivia, um, all the magazine subscriptions to sport and sports illustrated and sporting news. And so I absorbed all this stuff and he, just because he's good at football, doesn't necessarily mean that he's a student of football. So, or of life. I mean, maybe he just doesn't, he blocked all this stuff out or, OJ didn't know of a certain age, and we can talk about my students at Canisius College, uh, what they did or did not know about OJ Simpson when we talked about uh, doing my interview. Um, but so LaShawn McCoy was just kind of like, well, why doesn't he, why not? Why doesn't he do interviews? And I said, well, you know, the whole double murder thing, and he just got out of prison, and, and the people around us are kind of chuckling. And he says, yeah, so? And I was like, well, so it I'll just kind of, to and it was a, yeah, it was like a bit of a, a challenge, I think, of like, so what kind of reporter are you if you can't get O.J. Simpson, yeah. to which I'm thinking, I'm not going to get O.J. Simpson, but it at least gave me the impetus to try. And, uh, and uh, then as I started to try, and I was hitting a lot of roadblocks, phone numbers that were disconnected, obviously, he's been in prison for nine years, yeah. so email addresses that bounced back or emails that just wouldn't get returned. So I know they went through, but nobody, I don't know if anybody was reading them. Um, attorneys who weren't returning my calls. It got to the point where it became a matter of principle that I was going to keep going until I got no for an answer. And then even then, maybe I can negotiate in some way. And uh, I never got no. I just kept getting ignored. And that made me as a journalist, and I guess my natural competitiveness, I kept, well, let's see what we can get. And then finally, I found a guy um, who is close to O.J. Simpson, um, a manager, if you will, um, who people don't know about. And I was able to locate this person, make my pitch, and he considered it. And he said, I'll take it to O.J. and see what O.J. says. And what it was originally going to be, Jennifer, was um, it wasn't going to be the interview that I sat down and did. It was going to be, because LaShawn McCoy was – kind of starry-eyed about the idea of me interviewing O.J. Simpson. And he he would say later on that he wanted to be there. So I pitched it as LaShawn McCoy and, I, and I'll sit down or you can, O.J. and LaShawn McCoy can sit down and talk football. And I'll just be a fly on the wall and see where the conversation goes. Well, it, then it was maybe going to be Thurman Thomas also, the Bills Hall of Fame running oh, back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was yeah. real popular back in the sure. 90s. and sure. So the three great running backs, uh, and it would be interesting to see if there's another team in the NFL that could match up the top three running backs like that, O.J. Simpson, Thurman Thomas, LaShawn McCoy, and getting them all in a room together would be good football talk, regardless of what you think. I can certainly see why that pitch would have worked better with O.J. Yes. Probably everything else he had received. He got very excited about the prospect. Um, Thurman Thomas immediately said he wasn't interested in it. Um, LaShawn McCoy was kind of, uh, I wasn't getting a definitive answer from LaShawn McCoy, but what happened was the Fox special that aired, uh, the If I Did It confession, the video, uh, the the interview with Judith Regan um, that aired 
uh, it started to get promoted on television as, you know, coming up, you know, or in two weeks, you know, watch Fox for this, you know, interview with OJ Simpson in which there, the snippets were leaking out that maybe there was an accomplice and all these other stuff. And so the Buffalo Bills stepped in at that point and said, look, LaShawn McCoy is not going to be able to do this interview. And so I then reached out to OJ and to OJ's people and I said, all right, now LaShawn McCoy's out. But if you're willing to sit down, I would still like to come out and do this interview. They were disappointed because, yeah. you know, OJ Simpson would still like to be able to be considered a legend of football. And so it was a uh, blow to him personally, which I mean, yeah, that, that to have the bills happen. kind of distance themselves from, right, from right. Him. or just the fact that he was going to be able to sit down and talk football with a player who he really is a big fan of. He loves LaShawn McCoy. He was photographed in his Jersey back when the bills were in the playoffs and OJ Simpson was at this bills backers bar in, in Las Vegas to watch the playoff game against the, uh, Jacksonville. And he was wearing his LaShawn McCoy Jersey so he was disappointed because he thought he was going to have a little summit, for lack of a better. Yeah, like kind of like term. a, hey, here's some of the greatest people in football. Right. Three, three great Bills running backs sitting down talking football. And to O.J. Simpson, that probably presented some sort of normalcy or uh, a, call, a hearkening back to the, the glory days for him when he was just a football player. Um, so they were upset that the interview wasn't going to come off as planned, but surprised. To, they actually to learn. didn't back out. He said, yeah, well, all right, might as well come out. He's in the mood wow. to do an interview, so you might as well come out and, and sit down. That and, is interesting. Uh, so it ended up being a three-hour interview. Yeah. So do you feel like if that Fox special had not aired, do you think LaShawn McCoy would have been more on board with it? Yeah, well, I don't even know for sure if LaShawn McCoy is the one who backed out. I think the Bills, the Bills. public relations staff may have just yeah. said, look, this isn't in our best interest. He's still a Buffalo Bills player. Yeah. Uh, if it were a retired player, I don't think they'd have any objection. Okay. But he still represents our brand and he wears our uniform. And this just didn't, wasn't. Yeah, that, that makes sense from a PR perspective. It is weird with the timing of the Fox special. If that had not come out, maybe they yeah. would have been less, you know, less resistant to the idea. That's, that's, right. that's well, really As it turned out, because LaShawn McCoy gave me his definitive no, or I should say the Bills said, no, yeah. this is, we won't be able to make this happen. That is what triggered the interview to happen, as in, hey, you might as well come out and do the interview now. Uh, and there was a belief that, hey, OJ might change his mind. So the longer we dilly, dally, uh, that um, maybe he won't want to do the interview. So the interview took place coincidentally the morning after the Fox special. Oh my gosh. And just by, because of when we got the no from the bills regarding LaShawn McCoy, it was all right, might as well do it now. And it just so happened to be the next day. And uh, it did create a bit of a different tone. I, I think, you know, I was, I watched it in my hotel room the night before uh, and it, it shaped some of the questions that I answered, but it really, what it did was it helped remind me of the audience and then, yeah. and, and give me some insight as to, you know, what the audience is going to be thinking as they read this article, because I think had that Fox special not aired, they would have not been as sensitive as they were. And they had every right to be sensitive, but it was good for me to be able to write it knowing that the audience is going to, is probably not just going to have the warm and fuzzies uh, taking a stroll down memory lane with OJ Simpson. Exactly. Now, between the time you started digging into this and the time the interview happened, how much time had elapsed. My first conversation with LaShawn McCoy was in December. Um, I think when I first made hit pay dirt regarding finding somebody who was actually going to take this to OJ Simpson for consideration, probably a month and a half, maybe two months. Um, so yeah, it took a while and I didn't think it was going to happen. And even though we were talking about the possibility of it happening, I wasn't putting together my line of questioning until I knew for sure that it had, it was going to happen because I didn't want to waste my time on it. Yeah, and exactly. Cause sometimes people will flake out or they'll change their mind or be sure. like, you know, yeah, I'm not doing that. So, and, that and there's also the part of me too, Jennifer, that's like, this interview is not going to happen. It's OJ yeah. Simpson. He yeah, doesn't it's like, oh. And why would he sit down with me? You know, but me being from a Buffalo paper, he played for the Buffalo bills that I didn't have a lot of cards to play when it came to convincing him to sit down with me of all people. So that was one card that I could play. And it turned out to be the Trump card because he, that's, that was the draw for him was 
I may as well talk to the place that if anybody remembers me fondly, if mm -hmm. it's going to be the people of yeah. Buffalo. So I might as well take a shot with the Buffalo news as opposed to TMZ or even CNN or Dateline or Barbara Walters or whomever, all the different Oprah, all the different people he had turned down. So yeah, I guess, you know, I'm proud that I was able to get the interview, but it also in many ways, as people have asked me how nervous was I, how anxious was I, it was in many regards just another interview because once you get it, you know, this neutrality that you have to conduct an interview with, um, it was just, and I kept, you know, I had my questions and uh, which I drew up on the plane, you know, it wasn't really into in the night before. And thankfully, I did it that way, too, because I had the Fox special in my mind as I was putting my the things I had to be conscious of. Um, and, um, and but really, it was the night before, the day before and the night before that I really put the interview together. Yeah, no, I agree. When I'm coming up with questions, I normally don't do it far. Most reporters don't do it far in advance. They, you know, because, again, they might something might happen and they might have a new right. nuance to go with. And I, th I think that's, it's so interesting to me, you know, between us as journalists, just to hear your process, hear about your process for going through all this and, and for securing the interview. A lot of journalists, again, no other journalist has been, you are the only one in at least yeah. 10 years to do this. You know, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. And do you have any idea in your mind what, what you think made OJ say yes to you versus again, Anybody else? The Buff that I'm from the Buffalo News or from the Buffalo Market. And if I were from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Houston Chronicle. Would have been a no. no I don't, I, or at least he doesn't listen or his manager. I had to get the manager to listen first because if the manager doesn't listen, then OJ doesn't even have a, a chance to, to decide whether or not he wants to do it. Um, so... You know, there were conditions which was considered controversial from, you know, some people. I got some pushback on social media regarding conditions, but to me, they were, uh, two of them were no brainers. Uh, yeah. the OJ's camp didn't want video, which fine, I work for a newspaper. So that, and that's one less thing for me to have to worry about as a print reporter. I didn't want to have to show up with my camera and set it up and, you know, be positioning and all right, are we in a shot yeah. here? You know, you want to do an interview and be able to sit there and just conduct the interview and be in that moment. Because if I'm constantly worrying about the, the audio, the, the quality of my audio or the video, you know, the, the positioning or blocking or doing what all the different things I need to do for a set or getting B roll or whoever knows what, but anyway, their, their um, concern was they didn't want us to then turn around and sell it, yeah. which is fine. That's not something we do anyway. The other thing was no, um, big promotion, no, uh, and no extraordinary promotion of the, the video or of the interview. And that's not something that we would do anyway. It's not like we would get it sponsored by anybody. Uh, and um, the other part of that, you know, with that condition is I don't want, this is a big exclusive interview. I don't want to go advertising that we have this video, the Buffalo news, because then you do hear from, or OJ would get those second round of phone calls from Oprah, yeah. from Barbara Walters, from 60 Minutes, from whomever, from Anderson Cooper. And that and, happens frequently. Someone, yeah. everyone else sees it and they're like, oh, he's talking. Yeah. So. And it has happened. Yeah. After the interview ran, he yeah. got all those calls again, yeah. or at least the attorney did. And it, with the thing, and, and I thought it was interesting. They weren't upset that he spoke with me. They were excited that, hey, he's talking now. He's so talking, yeah. And that's, too. that typically is the mentality. Well, if he's talking to one outlet, we've got a shot now, so let's go after right. it. You know, well, so it was not in our best interest to advertise this anyway. So we needed to be on the down low. The one that was most controversial, I think though, the condition was that the subject should be limited to football. Now I can agree to that condition, but I knew that when I showed up, questions weren't going to be, or the topics weren't going to be only about football. And there are also a lot of things that you can talk about through the prism of football, such as you know, one thing that a lot of people have wondered about uh, regarding his, uh, his brain and whether or not he's been damaged, as you see from uh, CTE in, in football players, especially from that era when safety you know, helmets weren't that great. Uh, and he had a heavy, heavy workload by any comparison, by any measure uh, from uh, – all the carries that he had, all the times, uh, the catches, uh, the kick returns. 
he had a heavy duty workload for his entire NFL career and also his three years at USC. So, uh, or excuse me, his two years at USC. So this is a guy who's taken a lot of punishment and we see what has happened with a lot of football players, um, suicidal thoughts, depression, violent mood swings. Um, now, not everybody, of course, but some, and there've been some very high profile incidences. Uh, Junior Seau, for instance, killing himself uh, and making it a point to kill himself in such a way that he didn't destroy his brain so that way he could donate it to science. So able to talk to OJ Simpson about brain damage is a football topic and I think a worthwhile one and one that he explored with me or at least gave his honesty uh, for it. Um, he talked about two concussions that he had been diagnosed with and maybe others, as they used to say back in the day, dinged up, you know, you got dings or your bell rung. They weren't really concussions, but they were what we know now to be referred to by doctors as subconcussive blows that do add up um, just almost as much as concussions do diagnose concussions. So, you're able to talk about a lot of things. And he, uh, he kept, couldn't help himself. He talked about prison. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, should I be faulted for a condition? You can, you can debate that. I'm happy with what I did. I sleep well at night. My bosses were clued in the entire way of what we would and would not do in terms of a condition. Uh, O.J. Simpson's people did at one point suggest that we even sign a document uh, that we wouldn't ask or refer to him in certain ways in the story. We, we obviously refuse to do that. Of course, and they want to try to control things as much Absolutely. on their end to, to protect their his interests. There's no yeah. such thing as an interview without conditions. Yeah. They all have conditions in some way. And in sports and in politics often, the biggest condition you get is interviewing somebody while their attorney or their PR person is standing right next to them. Yeah. with the ability to jump in and say, he's not answering that, or I'm sorry, but we're not going there, or yeah, this interview's over. There are conditions all yeah. over the place. And right. I think that there are a lot of people who are saying, you could, you should never agree to any conditions. That's, but that's, that's just- That's ridiculous. Pollyanna stuff. Yeah, and in your defense, many, many interviews are only done because there are conditions on it. Because again, right. a lot of people wouldn't even do interviews if the general policy was, you know, we won't have any restrictions on this. They just, you would see a lot less stuff on TV. You'd read about a lot less stuff. That's just not how, that's not how this business works. Again, you could criticize it, but again, if you was hadn't, it, perfect? it wasn't perfect. Yeah. And if you it hadn't agreed to those, scenario, if you hadn't agreed to those restrictions, it wouldn't have happened, period. That's right. That's exactly so. right. Well, this is, again, this is so fascinating. So when you guys did the interview, what was it you and him? Was there anyone else there? There were four of us there, and I didn't know really how it was going to go. There were two. Um, he lives in a double-gated community. So even when you get through the first gate, you still have to have a passcode to get through the second gate, and it's armed security and everything. So we had a driver to get us into the, 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 the development uh, and the manager who set up the interview. And I didn't know if they were going to sit there the entire time and try to control it. If anybody else was going to be there, I wasn't sure. Uh, but they didn't. They let us go, and we sat there for three hours. Uh, we were interrupted only a couple of times with a phone call. Um, you know, here, I think there were a couple of phone calls. Uh, he was going to go golfing later in the day and needed to arrange or find out the timing of that. So it was three, pretty much three interrupted hours uh, sitting outside on a back patio, uh, on this golf course where he lives in, in a house that's not his, he, you know, he's staying there, um, driving a car that's borrowed. And, you know, he's doesn't, he lives very well for a guy who doesn't have anything. Um, yeah. For, and for, um, for you, that kind of evokes a lot of trust that they were willing to give you the address where he lives. So, uh, right. Well, I, I was driven like, there. I was, oh, I had to meet, we met somewhere. I was picked up and then I was driven there. But yeah, I mean, uh, I know what road we're on and I see the, the, num the, yeah. the number on the house <laughs> when I'm walking in. But um, also it should be known that so many people found out where OJ Simpson was staying and the way it was explained to me is that it's on a somewhat regular occurrence. Um, there will be helicopters flying over, you know, so people can get their shots of the, the place where OJ lives. And um, because the man, the man where he's staying, the man who owns the house where he's staying was a character witness for him and was involved in the, uh, the trial in Nevada um, when he was sentenced for, you know, it was a, a bungled 
memorabilia heist uh, in which he was over penalized by a judge who was making sure that he got punished for Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson's deaths. Um, so it was a highly publicized trial and this man was in the trial. So everybody knew his name and you could look up where this guy lived and that's where OJ's staying. And so the helicopters would show up and um, people from the other side of the golf course would get their long angled lenses and allow members of the media to come and take their shots of, of OJ with their still cameras. So there's been paparazzi and, but yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I, I hate this. I hate the word zeitgeist, but when it comes to, there are very few people who are in our consciousness like O.J. Simpson is as a as a pop culture or a historical touchstone. I, we remember where we were, and we were talking about it earlier in this um, in this in this interview, and how how he's affected or how ubiquitous he was at one time and still is. And the Saturday before. I think it was the Saturday before I did the interview. There was uh, Saturday Night Live, which of course you get used to in, in late night monologues, but Saturday Night Live had a new OJ joke. I mean, it was, it's was it been so long, but they're still making OJ references on uh, all over the place. So um, it was somebody doing an impersonation of OJ Simpson. Uh, it was uh, 25th anniversary of Jurassic Park was the premise of the SNL. Oh, scandal. okay. So they use right. like the time frame or... They're bringing out all of the people. So it's a chance for all the people on SNL to dust off all their impersonations. Yeah. And it's all the people who were trying out for the roles on Jurassic Park, but didn't get the part. You know, oh, so you OJ Simpson was one of them? So Keenan Thompson does OJ Simpson. And he says, here I am, OJ Simpson, 1993. Oh, boy. Life is going to be great for me, you know, because oh. it's before everything is taking a turn. And he's like, man. Can you just imagine being O.J. Simpson in 1993? The world is beautiful and the whole thing. And so, yeah, people are still making these jokes. He's everywhere. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to see how the guy lives and copes with being somebody who's everywhere. Now, you had mentioned that he, um, he doesn't watch things with him in it. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that he doesn't I, really I could like buy that. Himself? I mean, that's what he said. Yeah, I asked him if he watched the the Fox special from the night before, and he said he hadn't, uh, that he hadn't watched the 30 for 30 uh, that ESPN did that won the Academy Award for Best Documentary uh, last year, or the, um, forgetting the network who did. Oh, the, the People versus O.J. Simpson on, was it on FX, I think? Yes, it was FX, that's right. Um, he didn't watch any of that, and I can believe that, because if you could, now for you or me, if we were the subject of a documentary, obviously we'd, we'd watch it, we'd be curious, but he has been in so, he's everywhere, as I've said, and how can you live your life? How could you function if you were so consumed with what people were saying about you, if you're O.J. Simpson? If he, in his mind, whether or not he believes that he didn't do anything or whether he truly is innocent or whether he was guilty, whatever, I think you can just, I mean, Remove that even from the conversation. The fact that he has to still get through daily life and to know that he's going to constantly be stopped by people on the street, whether they want a selfie or whether they want to yell F you at him or call him a murderer, um, to actually go out of your way to watch these types of things would just ruin your day. And people would say, well, good. We want OJ to have, have you know, have his day ruined on a daily basis. And he should be reminded of all the pain he's caused. And regardless of, of that, in his mind, between his ears, he still needs to function on a daily basis to his best ability. And I would think that if I were, if it got to that point, that you start blocking it out. I mean, I'm just thinking about, I don't even look at the comment section underneath an article, yeah. whether, whether it's about OJ Simpson or the Bills tight end. Um, I don't look at a lot of social media because I know it's going to ruin my day. So now imagine being OJ Simpson where your life is a comment section. Um, yeah, I would say it's probably pretty easy to say, you know what, I'm just going to avoid everything I can. I'm going to practice my golf game and I'm going to go out and I'm going to play 18 holes today and I'm going to come back to my house and whatever. I mean, he, he, he can't watch TV without the risk of his name just popping up somewhere or, getting online. I mean, it's everywhere. Do you, so do you think he uses social media? 
Um, I know he doesn't use Twitter because I've been talking to, I've, I've, I've stayed in touch with his manager and there's a, he may want to, he's been talking about maybe getting a Twitter account. Um, so that's, that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, OJ Simpson on Twitter. Oh yes. boy. Yeah, exactly. That would be uh he would definitely get a lot of, a uh, lot of tweets at him. He sure. would have to probably have somebody read them for yeah. him to avoid, you know, all, all the, the hate that he's sure to get. Um, but no, I don't, I got the sense that he doesn't do social media. You also have to keep in mind, he was in jail for nine years. So go yes. back to 2000 and what would that be? 2009, Twitter is barely a thing. Um, MySpace and Facebook were the, were about it, right? With, with, <laughs> and so he had, a, I did notice he had an, I, uh, an Apple watch, um, that he was trying to figure out. He was on, he was having texting and he was doing a lot of voice texting and things like that. But just think of all the technology yeah. that he hasn't had and all the stuff. So. Yeah. Not, yeah. And his time in prison, that's a pretty long time to, you know, not be up on what the latest thing is. Right. That's interesting. Did, what was your impression of him as a person interacting with him for three hours? That's a, again, <laughs> that's gotta be surreal. I say this knowing exactly how it's going to sound as I, as it comes out of my mouth, but this is the consensus. He's a nice guy. And uh, he's disarming uh, in how charming he is. He'll he'll talk about anything. He laughs easily. Um, you can go anywhere. Anytime I asked him a question, he didn't get upset by it. I thought when I was going to ask him about CTE, here's a guy who, you know, he's been around the block a few times, and he's going to say, all right, here this reporter is from Buffalo, who I've never met before, is coming here asking me about whether or not I have brain damage. It's pretty easy for him to link that to the murders yeah so if i'm oj and i'm playing chess a couple of moves ahead as he because he's known as being so savvy and has been since the 1970 early 1970s and being in movies and on tv and as a broadcaster and the whole thing that he would immediately say you know what i'm not i don't feel like talking about that i don't want to talk about whether or not i may have brain issues but he did talk about it and he was just fine whatever you want to ask me let's talk about it I mean, that was the, that was the feeling you got. You never actually said that, but, um, it was, um, but you could also say if you, if you believe that he did it, then you, the charm of somebody like that is how you probably can get away with it. So he's, uh, he's, he's a nice guy. Did you come away from this experience? I should, with, wait, hang on oh. a second. He appeared to be a nice guy. He, okay. I, he was a nice guy to me. So I don't want to say any blank. I don't want to make it seem like I'm making some definitive statement. Yeah. But it was, he was welcoming. He was accommodating. He was gracious. And um, that was, of course, a three-hour window into a very complicated life. Coming out of this experience, do you feel like your personal view of him has changed at all from before the interview and then after the interview? Well, I guess it, it would be impossible not to just because I had zero interaction with him. And now I have a lot, I had a lot of interaction with him you know, from an interviewing standpoint, three hours is not, you know, you think about it in the context of a work day, it's really not that much, you know, that takes you from the time you flip on your computer in the morning to lunch. But in, as you know, Jennifer, when it comes to interviewing, three hours is a long time to sit and interview somebody uh, because you're getting into a lot of areas and you you're uh, there's an intimacy too with an interview and I don't want to be too um, melodramatic about it but there is when you're sitting there across the table from somebody and it's just a give and take of an interview you explore a lot of areas that that person generally just doesn't wish to talk about you know while he's sitting down for lunch with his friends or his buddies or co-workers or whatever you're talking about things that that person maybe forces that person to be introspective uh, if you're doing your job as an interviewer anyway, but, uh, so three hours is a long time now. So yeah, I think it can't help, but at least now I have a basis of what I, I can recall being in the same room as OJ Simpson, but I will say this, and a lot of people have asked me to, um, do I think he did it? Um, my opinion on that didn't change based on three hours with him. Mm -hmm. I will not answer the question though when people ask and people are going to say, why do you want to dodge it? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but primarily it's because my role as an interviewer, whether I think he did it or didn't, if I declare it, 
let's say, you know, if I declare ahead of time, I don't think you did it. You know, if I have a conversation with him in which he asks me and I say, you know, OJ, I don't think you did it. I think you got a raw deal. Then that colors our entire interview yeah. because now he's, he thinks he's talking with a buddy. And if I were to say, OJ, I do think you did it. Now I'm an adversary. Uh, and, and the interview takes on a totally different, um, totally different tint. And so it's important for me. And thankfully nobody asked me, and maybe you ask, you don't ask because you don't want to know the answer, but nobody had throughout any of this course of me talking about booking this interview with his manager or throughout the course of the interview, or even after the interview and the discussions I've had with, the, with OJ and his people. Nobody's ever asked me, so do you think he did it? Or what do you think? Or are you friend or foe? I would say, I don't think it's your role to say that, you know, it's, it's not, but a lot of people want to know you're a journalist. A lot of people want to know, like, how could you sit down with a murderer? You know, that's just their general take is how can you do this? And it's like, it's not my job. If I'm going to get an interview and I'm supposed to be the conduit to give you the information of what OJ thinks or how OJ lives, you don't want to know what my feeling is on that. That's not my, you need, you need it to be as neutral as possible. You need me to be as neutral as possible. So that way, when you read what he has to say, you can determine for yourself. I'm not determining for you. I think I greatly respect that, that you're trying to be on as neutral playing field as possible. And I, I read your, I actually read all of the articles you wrote surrounding the interview. And, and my verdict is I thought they were fair. They, again, you did not seem... I, I honestly, if, if I had to guess what you thought of him, I would not know. You did not really make that apparent. And that's what your job is, is to report what happened, report what your interactions with, were with him were like without editorializing it. Yeah, I think that there was a sense, or at least that maybe I'm, maybe I'm projecting or maybe I'm applying it to myself or I'm thinking how I would react as a reader of these stories is that People thought that I was being an apologist for OJ, that I would eat by even doing the interview, or that I must not have thought he did it, because why else would you be sitting down with a guy who was accused of such grisly things? But it's, it's foreseeable that I could think that he did it, and I could do this interview. Um, and it's also foreseeable that by doing this interview, maybe I didn't think he did it, and I would rather the reader not care what I think. Um, which is why I'll not say. And you and I both know that no journalist would turn down, pro I don't know any journalist that would turn down the opportunity to get an interview with this man. Like I. Yeah, to me, it was commensurate with, um, and he's, he's dead now, so it's not the perfect analogy, but if he were still alive, if I were to come to any reporter and say, look, I'm going to give you three hours of Michael Jackson, but you can only talk music. Yeah. Everybody would take that interview. You're not allowed to talk about child molestations or accusations or payoffs or uh, plastic surgeries or his fall or whatever. You can't talk about any of that. You can only talk music. And there'd be a line around the globe of people who would yeah. say, yep, I'll do that interview. Yeah. So for all the people criticizing you for doing it, I would say as a journalist, that that's your job. Your job is to get interesting, thought-provoking stories. And, and I think you did that. So I, I appreciated your work and I was, I, again, I, we, you and I first connected on Twitter because I had posted your article and I, I thought, I said, I thought this was a very fair um, interview. And again, nobody, no journalist would be like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Especially even, even if you don't want to do it, your boss would probably be like, yeah, you, yeah, we you want know, you they, they want the chance. <laughs> right. and, and I remember as a, as a college kid, I was interning with the, uh, this reporter in Pittsburgh and uh, he had a good, I remember we were talking in the car and he's like, you know what, your job uh, is not just to be this, their friend or to have them like you, your job is to get the story. So again, that can be, that can cross some lines sometimes, or some people may feel a little conflicted about that. But again, you're, you're paid, your profession is to, to write stories. And that was one of your comebacks to somebody on Twitter was I, they're like, how could you do this? You're like, I like to get paid to write stories. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's a very that's valid defense. Thing. <laughs> it's and, a nice uh, way to make a living. And you even said you even said during the interview with him, he had told you that he had been approached by everybody. Everybody wanted to talk to him. Yeah, and uh, Oprah's name was mentioned a bunch of times. I don't really know the complete rundown, but you know, I at one point because uh, I knew that I was going to be asked 
about the relevance. You know, there are a lot of people out there who just don't care about OJ Simpson and don't want to hear about it. And that's fine. I'm not offended if you, you know, decided to crumple up the newspaper and throw it in your recycle bin without even opening it up that day. That's fine. But it's there for the people who are curious and do want to read it. You have that ability to, to not read it. And in fact, that is part of the story too. You know, that's part of who OJ is, is that you can just be totally revolted by him and not want to know word one about what he's up to. Um, but and I've lost my train of thought, which I'm no surprised had not happened sooner. I know, because uh, you, I heard your radio show and you are very oh, like. Right. So you, that reminds me because it was the radio show. The next day I was having my radio show and I said, I know I'm going to get a call that somebody's going to say, why does anybody care? Yeah. And so I Googled the Buffalo News and OJ Simpson and I did a chart of all of the sites, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, every major outlet, uh, the Washington Post, the New York, nah, maybe not the New York Times, but Newsday, all of um, ESPN, even the black culture uh, media outlets like uh, Vibe and Essence and Jet, and you know, it was like uh, The Undefeated, which is ESPN's uh, site. They, everybody out there in the mainstream media said, we need to aggregate this. So my content was being taken and saying, OJ talked was generally the gist of it. And none of it was how dare the Buffalo News sit down with OJ Simpson. It was all OJ Simpson, whether you like him or not, is newsworthy. Yeah. And so the list, I wish I could have you know, held it up. Yeah, to and I saw a lot of this. I saw a lot of the stories. Some of them were um, his his thoughts on Colin Kaepernick, his thoughts on yeah, I was surprised by that. It was, all, it was a lot. Like, there were a lot of random stories. And um, when, when I first heard about your interview, I had seen some story on Facebook. It was like, OJ Simpson's talking about, uh, thinks Colin Kaepernick was wrong. And at first, I thought it was going to be one of those, like, TMZ paparazzi type videos where they catch OJ at a gas station talking. Right. And then I was looking at the story and I, cause I was thinking at the time I was like, why would someone just ask OJ about Colin Kaepernick? Like I was like, you know, trying to equate. And then I saw it was like part of like a longer form interview. I was like, Oh, this makes a lot more sense. Uh, but a lot, I think a lot of people see those headlines and, and it's easy to get the wrong impression or to not get the full context of what's happening. Right. Well, that's where I thought I was clever and uh, it's a football question, right? Uh, it was a chance and I wasn't really, Yes, it's a Colin Kaepernick question, and you may think that's clickbait, and in a way, I'm sure it is, and that's what it became, because it was aggregated out as clickbait, uh, it, that and the Donald Trump question, but those oh, were yes. football questions. Donald Trump tried to buy the Buffalo Bills, and he tried to buy them uh, when Ralph Wilson, who was the owner of the Buffalo Bills, died. That was the owner for OJ. You know, we talked about, you know, OJ Simpson talked about Ralph Wilson quite a bit in the, in, for my story. Um, so it's a way of, do you care what O.J. Simpson thinks? Yes or no, but at least it's O.J. Simpson talking about social issues because he is a social, what do you, what do you want to call it? I keep using the word touchstone, yeah, but he yeah, was, he, you know, the, the racist LAPD and the way that the whole trial was um, positioned in the, in the court of public opinion and how he was found not guilty was because of, social issues and black culture and black versus white, you know, the blacks of Southern California versus the predominantly white LAPD. And so, yeah, I was going to ask him about police brutality, which is what Colin Kaepernick is protesting uh, during the national anthem when he, when he kneels or did back when he played. And so that was a way for, I was hoping for OJ to maybe open up on that. Um, didn't necessarily work out that way, but it, it became the thing that a lot of people focused on that the Donald Trump and Colin Kaepernick were the two things that the mainstream media latched on to the most when I thought it would be the CTE stuff, which was only touched on a little ESPN, the sports sites picked up on that. But if you really want to get a look inside OJ Simpson or the trial, uh, the murders, uh, whether or not you, because a lot of people say there's no way OJ Simpson committed those crimes. He was too nice of a guy. Uh, there are still people who believe that. Um, then you may say, well, but maybe he has brain damage. And people didn't really seem to latch onto that as much as they did just the, the fact that Trump 
Trump drives. And he used to play golf with Donald Trump, and he was at his wedding. Yeah, to Marla Maples. OJ was actually oh. there. Ooh, that's that's got a that had to have been an interesting wedding to actually attend. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> now you you did say I, I heard you say that you heard back from OJ about what he thought of the article, and what yeah. did, what kind I of feedback did right you get? Away. From him? Um, I, it, in in one sense, I didn't care what he thought. Because once it's over, it's over. And I have to write what I have to write. And I included all the things that I thought might make him upset. Ron, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson are mentioned multiple times in my story. I mentioned the murder trial. I mentioned the white Bronco chase and the humiliations and uh, the trial um, in which he was convicted for the memorabilia heist. You know, being in prison. He talked about being in prison, too. So that opened the door there. Um, so I thought, you know, he's going to read this because talking about it's one thing, you know how it is. Um, people say things and they think it's okay until they see themselves on television saying yeah, and then it. they're like, Ooh. it's like, I shouldn't have said that or reading it. I think reading it puts it into just a different place in your brain where you you say, Oh man, I said that. Um, but I heard back right away and he, uh, through his manager, he said, you were fair. You didn't, uh, ambush us. You did what you said you were going to do, uh, or you handled this the way you said you were going to handle it when you approached us. And, and now people may say, well, what do we care about whether or not OJ was happy with the interview? I, as my reputation, as I go to somebody else and, you know, <laughs> they'd be like, you know, I interviewed OJ Simpson and he didn't think I burned him. <laughs> you know, so yeah. maybe you shouldn't feel too upset about, you know, sitting down with me because I'm somebody who can be trusted. Yeah. Um, and, and that's you know, the thing you did. You didn't, you know, you didn't try to manipulate the situation nope. and you were very honest about your intentions. Yeah, I included all of the negative stuff. Yeah. I mean, with the exception of any kind of gotcha moment where I said, J OJ, did you do it or didn't you do it? Did you not yeah. kill your wife or whatever badgering question I could have asked that might've made some critic happy uh, that I did the interview. It's not as though OJ Simpson was one question away from confessing. Yeah. You know, to, to murder uh, in the interview. So the other part of this too, Jennifer, is, as you know, is I want there to be a second interview and I want the barriers to come down even more for the second interview, maybe even a third interview, who knows what, but the barriers, you have to start somewhere. This was his first interview in at least a decade. You have to start somewhere. There's a building of trust that needs to happen between the interviewer and the subject. And when it's all over with, I didn't want OJ to, have regretted sitting down to talking with Tim Graham. Now with the reporter, I don't care, but not with me. Um, so I handle everybody with the same amount of care, regardless of what they've been accused of, uh, what they've been, um, whatever they've been acquitted of, whatever they've been praised for. I handle everybody with the same uh, care and attention. And uh, I guess that couldn't be any clearer than in this case. That's interesting. So do you think there's a reason now why Again, I can see why, but OJ is does not seem to be interested in doing further interviews or going on TV again. So I don't, well, I don't know if I see that happening again. Maybe not outside of you, but like he's not interested in talking to Entertainment Tonight or. He's you know. been approached because people think he's in the mood to talk now. Yeah. And my thinking would be, yes, I would love to get the second interview, but this is my defeatist. Well, I guess I'm not technically a defeatist <laughs> because I did actually get go forth and actually procure the interview, but the same mindset that takes over when I say, I'm not going to interview OJ. There's no way I'm going to get OJ. Um, now I'm thinking there's no way I'm going to get the second interview because I'm just thinking if he had a pleasant experience with me, then he's going to want to sit down with somebody who he's known over the years, you know, somebody in television, you know, some, maybe it's uh, Al Michaels or Bob Costas or whomever. And he's going to want to sit down and do something that's with somebody he knows but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't like the opportunity to do it because I do think that there's a trust there, obviously, at least that's what he's, what he's um, uh, said to me or declared to me. And so if you trust me, then let's go and let's see what else we can talk about. Let's see what else you're comfortable with. Um, but here, the thing about it too, and just from a practical standpoint, he is uh, the civil suit in which he was found guilty also mentioned in the story that he was found guilty uh, or liable, I should say, in the civil suit for the death of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, he owes a lot of money. 
And so a lot of people would like to pay him for interviews, but he knows that if he takes money for an interview, he just has to give it to settle the civil suit. So if there's a reluctance there, I think he doesn't see any benefits to doing an interview. People think of him, what they're going to think of him. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, just regular journalism, whether it's Anderson Cooper or whomever, they don't pay for interviews either. So if he wanted to do something like that, maybe he wants to sit down, you know, you go old school because OJ's in the seventies. Maybe he sits down with Larry King. I don't know. Something that's considered. Larry King does have that YouTube show. Yeah. Something comfortable and putting on an old pair of loafers and I'll sit down with Larry King and talk for a half hour about whatever. I don't know. But, um, he hasn't done those. And from, from what I'm told, he's not interested in doing those, but uh, that he has talked to me about doing a second interview, perhaps in Buffalo. Yeah. Wow. So he would go to Buffalo and you would talk to him there? That would yeah. Be just in the last week or so, he was finally cleared. Uh, he can leave the state. Leave the state. If, you, a- if you get the chance to talk with him again, what do you want that story to be like? Well, I would like for it to be not as much about football and about what's happened in his life and looking back on, I don't know, what he's learned. I mean, that's something that I would have to sit down probably with a lot of people I trust and say, all right, how do we, how do we attack this? Because I don't know that, you know, I have a lot of confidence in my abilities, but all throughout this process, uh, even in the first interview, I've always, I always keep my editors in the loop. We sit down and I say, I'm always looking for feedback. Um, Friends of mine who I trust, friends of mine in the business who I say, you know, I was able to tell a couple of people, hey, look, I'm interviewing OJ in a couple of days. Um, Or after I did the interview, um, in the four days, I think it was, in between the interview and before it finally ran, there were a couple of people I was able to reach out to and say, all right, here's the interview. What what stands out to you? Uh, As the Just people I I was able to bounce ideas off of. So it's not as though it's a solo effort. And so if I were to get a second chance in an interview, I think there's just, there's a lot of people I would want to, um, I guess, you know, just try to spitball with and yeah. say, all right, what, what's the right thing? And also there's the thing, what's the right thing to do here? Um, I, just because I'm doing this interview doesn't mean I, I want to give everybody the finger and say, hey, look, you should have got the, you, you, uh, just because you didn't get this interview doesn't mean, you know, it's a bad interview and, um, Hey, if you don't like it, then you, you get the interview yourself and you ask him your questions. No, I, I still want to do as much of the, I wanted to make it as honest and as forthcoming of an interview as I possibly can, given, given the circumstances. In your mind, is, the, is this the interview? Is this the story of your career? No, you know, it's probably the most known, um, but the two stories, uh, well, a handful of stories stand out. In terms of coverage, the ownership, when the bills were sold to when Ralph Wilson died, that was the biggest story, I think, in, in Western New York sports history. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest stories in Western New York history, period, because the bills were always, the, the belief was going to be that they were going to leave for Los Angeles. Or when Ralph Wilson died, the team was gone. Uh, and people had been dreading for a long time Ralph Wilson's death and losing their bills. And to be able to cover that whole thing, which involved Donald Trump, uh, yeah. John Bon Jovi was one of the uh, interested bidders. It's just crazy. And then to have the team uh, sold to local interests and that the team wasn't going to move and Bills fans weren't going to lose their team. That, to me, is the mo- one of the more rewarding stories. A story I did on Daryl Talley, uh, the Bills uh, linebacker who played during the Super Bowl years, and uh, he was going through a, a very difficult uh, stretch in life, and, and still is in, in many regards. But he has, um, he believes he has CTE issues and depression, and he had suicidal thoughts and lost his business, and his his daughter's college funds were were blown trying to salvage his business because he didn't want to have to lay off anybody and. Um, foreclosed on his house. And so anyway, that story created a big outpouring in which Bill's fans raised, I don't know, it was almost $200,000 to help him. You know, he was borrowing money from his former teammates to pay the rent. Um, so that was, the, that was a story that actually ch- changed a life. And one of my prized possessions is a, a jersey that he signed uh, that says, uh, 
Tim, your words changed my life, Daryl Talley. Wow. And that was, it doesn't get much deeper than that in terms of your role as a journalist. Now, so the O.J. Simpson interview didn't change anybody's life. So um, it was it was just a probably the thing that, you know, in fact, the Daryl Talley story, I think, even has over the course of time has gotten more clicks mm -hmm. than the O.J. story. But um, so it's not just about the web traffic that's going to determine yeah. in terms of what I rank as my most meaningful story. Yeah, well, it's also like what story most are you most proud of or are you most, you know, yeah. excited it's not to do? Simpson. No, the get, you know, the get yeah. was pretty cool. That was, a, yeah, that was, a, that, like, I read that, I was like, how did he do, th like, yeah. the first thing I was thinking was not like, oh, he shouldn't, have. it was like, how the heck did he, did he get him? Yeah, I'll be telling that story for a while. Yeah, or at least partial the story. I, the, the person's name still is, it will remain yeah. a mystery because uh, he didn't want me, he doesn't want me to say who he is. I can see why not. Field, uh, he doesn't want to field all the requests. Yeah. And I don't want people to know who he is either because... Yeah. Hey, I found him, and if you want to interview OJ, then you find him. And that happens a lot in journalism. Everybody kind of piggybacks on the work of somebody else. Like somebody else will get a really awesome interview or a good story, and then the competition will try to do the same story. Um, so I think I think you keeping your sources uh, kind of to yourself is probably is probably probably for the best. Um, okay, so you said you te also teach at Canisius College. And you told your students what you'd been doing. Um, and how did they, re you, you had a funny story about the way they reacted. Yeah, the interview took place on a Monday and I teach my class on Monday nights. And so um, it happened, as I mentioned, it happened at the last second. So I think it was Friday or Saturday, I sent out a mass email to the class list that said, look, no class on Monday. I'm being sent out of state on assignment. I didn't tell them anything about it. And then the story ran online on Friday and in the paper on Sunday. So then it's now the following Monday. And I stood up in front of the class and I said, uh, so show of hands, how many people know why I didn't, why we didn't have class last week? And only about four of the 15 raised their hands. So a couple things that they don't follow their instructor's Twitter feed. Uh, they don't read the paper. Uh, and they don't, it was on the front page of the Buffalo News on Sunday, or check out the buffalonews.com. And Canisius College, for those who don't know, is located in Buffalo. So these are aspiring journalism students who uh, didn't have any idea <laughs> what I was up to. And so I had them read the story. So that way we could talk about this is a journalism moment, you know, about, you know, or the teaching moment about getting an interview and gatekeepers and how you, you know, being persistent and um, and I wanted to know what they thought as discerning you know, journalism consumers about the things like the conditions. And, you know, we're going to get into the, how the interview came to be and setting up the structure of the interview and all that stuff. And I thought they'd have questions. And I was surprised. Now we're dealing with current college students who are anywhere from 18 to 22 years old uh, who, didn't, who knew that O.J. Simpson was a football player but had no idea how good he was. Yeah. Um, that a couple people died, but they weren't really sure that who, who they were, you know, maybe it was his mother or a girlfriend or whatever. It was just, it was funny that <laughs> what they didn't know. Yeah. yeah that, and, that, that, that they don't, they obviously don't have as much detail as we do just because we live through it. Right. That's interesting. So they just had no, wow. They had no clue. They weren't impressed. Wow. What, so for journalism students, obviously since you teach it, what kind of advice do you have to aspiring journalists to, to, to experience success and to, and to do good journalism? Well, the one thing that I always tell my students is if I can do it, anybody can do it because they just by merely taking a journalism class are ahead of where I was. I took zero journalism classes. I had two writing classes in college, um, but I did it the hard way also. I was a, did a lot of grunt labor uh, it really wasn't until I was in the business for seven, eight years. Well, five or six years for sure. When I got to Las Vegas, things really took off. But Las Vegas wasn't the market that it is now. It has two major league sports teams now. But at the time, it was just UNLV and boxing pretty much and maybe a golf scene. You know, had a, obviously a golf scene. But it was a great place for a young sports journalist to be able to go in and learn and to do all the different things like writing columns. And I covered a lot of high school sports even there. Um, so uh, I guess the thing that really helped me out the most was I moved a lot. So be ambitious, 
and be willing to move. Because if you think that you're going to get a job at your hometown newspaper or at your hometown ABC affiliate, um, they're not going to, the chances of that are slim. But when you open up the country uh, and say that you can get a job at any of, you know, from coast to coast and tell all the different versions of television stations out there and newspapers and websites, then you have the ability to get that experience that you need. So that way your hometown paper will notice you when you send in your resume and clips or your highlight reel or whatever it be. So be ambitious, be willing to move. And uh, there, I know some people who are very talented journalists who've refused to move and are now in their thirties and forties and have been freelance journalists or independent contractors their their entire careers and they've never had given themselves the opportunity to get a full-time job by by actually going out and and experiencing life that's some solid advice here now you said the oj story did pretty well online um how many how many people do you think read it i don't know i wish i would have known you were going to ask me that What's I would I want to say it that it probably did pretty well online. I'm, I'm going to guess. Yeah. I think the first day it got 120,000 clicks, 120,000 views. Uh, I think by the weekend it was around 160, something like that. The Daryl Talley story, I think is somewhere around 180. Um, so I don't know if the OJ, the OJ story is probably maybe has overtaken it. I don't know, but that, yeah, that's healthy. Well, this has been so fascinating. Again, I really wanted to talk to you to just to see oh, inside your brain and to get the process behind all this because I was so I was so interested in knowing and knowing more about you and about you know how you got this interview no one else was able to get. So I really appreciate Thank you for having you me on. This. No, this has been awesome. All I right, feel like a real journalist. Oh, you are totally. I'm being oh, and, and I want to involved like so, Mr. Graham. What do you think the Bills are going to do with the 12th pick? You know, it's like. Can we talk about journalism and our journalism? Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm not even going to pretend to BS my way through sports stuff because clearly this is not my wheelhouse. And I do want to end on a bit of a lighter note. I want to ask you a few Buffalo-related questions if you're cool with that. Sure. Um, you should be pretty – I'm going to guess you'll um, – all right, Buffalo, favorite places to eat? Well, I – I have to say that Anchor Bar is overrated because I know a lot of people may be re watching this. Uh, no, Tim. Oh. oh, sure. Anchor Bar is way overrated. <laughs> uh, it is considered the birthplace of the wing. But uh, my favorite is from a more of an established joint is Duff's. Okay. Duff's guy, but also uh, my neighborhood bar, which is one of the more underrated wing places in Western New York called Elmo's in Getzville. Um, so that's from the wing standpoint. Um, there's a place downtown, it's relatively new, it's only a couple of years old, called Sear, S-E-A-R, and it is in the um, Embassy Suites building, or the Avant building downtown, and um, yeah, let me see. It's, uh, it's a great steakhouse, uh, partially owned uh, by former Bills players, Fred Jackson, Brian Mormon, and uh, Terrence McGee, but it is maybe the best fine dining experience I've had in in Buffalo. So highly recommend those two places. Awesome. Are you, Oh, and I guess I got to go with man? like uh, Ted's, right? Like Ted's, Ted's, Oh yes. Ted's, Ted's hot dogs. The hot dogs. Who's got the best pizza in Buffalo? You think? Picasso's on Picasso. transit. Oh my gosh. I used to go, like I used to live near there and we would go there all the time that they do have the best pizza. All right. So I want to weigh in on the anchor bar thing. Okay. So no conversations. over. Oh no, Tim, we've got to, I think the sauce <laughs> at the anchor bar is great. The right. wings themselves could, could use some improvement, but the sauce, I think, is probably one of the better sauces well, I've You can had. buy that sauce. That sauce is yes. Frank's. So, but yeah, the wings themselves, I thought they were a little on the small side uh, when I went there. Um, but I did, I did enjoy, I enjoyed the establishment. The best wings I ever had, though, Jim Kelly had a, like a very short-lived sports bar. I think when I was in like middle school, those right. wings were the best wings I've ever had in my life. No kidding. They were super huge. I'm sure the chickens probably had some weird hormones going on. The wings were seriously like this big and they were, they were amazing. Those are the best wings hands down. I've ever had my entire life yeah. was at the Jim Kelly sports bar. That is the first positive thing out. I've ever heard mentioned about that place. About that place. Really? Yeah. I love the wings. <laughs> I, I'm a big chicken wing gal. Um, but yeah, I'm a big Ted's fan. Anderson's custard. 
Oh, right. Oh, I, right. there is a lot about the food that I really do miss about Buffalo. So I just wanted to get your take on. Why hasn't <laughs> beef on WEC? Why shouldn't there, that is, seems to be something that every should be everywhere in the country. It's just a Buffalo thing. But the idea of eating yeah. a roast beef sandwich on a, a pretzel roll, essentially, shouldn't that, and shouldn't people, why, why isn't that a thing? You know, I, I don't know. In, and also, why do people outside Buffalo have ranch dressing with wings? That's another thing I don't, I don't quite understand. I think, it's, I think it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. But I'm a huge chicken wing fan. I, um, outside of Buffalo, I, I don't mind Hooters. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I think I know. I, <laughs> I, I like Hooters. I like the sauce there. And I think they, they um, deep fry the wings in a manner that I, I enjoy them. All right. Um, now, I've said this on my radio show before, so this isn't a big secret, <laughs> but I'm reluctant in bringing this up. It's, it's the best, maybe my favorite wings of all time were when I lived in Florida uh, from a local Walmart. They made Walmart. a turkey wing, and it was sensational. Oh. And so I guess if you can have, uh, you know, you can have your, your uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hey, you know what? Walmart does have good stuff. So I'm not, I'm not too fancy. I'm definitely not too fancy from Walmart. Believe me. Um, what, I, you I, just I, mentioned, what was it? You, now I'm going through your pizza. We, we, you oh, just um, mentioned your, we're talking about Picasso's pizza. Picasso, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. They, they do have the best pizza. I, I, I think they have one of the better pizza places and, and we would always just get pizza and wings, you know, pizza and wings is the thing. So have some celery, blue cheese. Oh, I do miss I do miss that, and my husband works in the restaurant industry, and he thinks chicken wings are overpriced. So we don't usually we don't normally buy them anymore. But um, he and he doesn't even like like he doesn't like going to wing places. So um, I you know I I don't mind going to Hooters. I think Hooters is fine. Yeah, if you can, if Hooters is an okay place for you to have wings, then I'm not so ashamed to say yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not. I have no shame about. It. I think I even made a video about it on one of my channels. I'm a woman who likes <laughs> eating at Hooters. Clearly, I'm not going for the scenery, but. You know, I think the food is pretty decent <laughs> there. Uh, they they also have a, I think every year they have a, a Mom's Eat Free special. So I know, I keep seeing that promotion come around every year. All right. I know, Mom's Eat Free, you know. I don't know that there is one in Buffalo anymore. Wait, the one that was over eat? by UB is uh, closed. Well, and the other place I think le that left Buffalo that I really liked was called Swish LA. It was a oh, yeah, Niagara Falls Bowl. They have one? Wait, they still have no, one? No, 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 it's gone. Oh, man. That was one of the – we used to go there quite a bit. There used to be one on transit. Um, I'm trying to remember what the cross street was, but I didn't even – when I was a kid, I didn't even realize it was a chain. I just, you know, I didn't know anything about that, so I just thought it was, like, the one we had. I thought it was, like, a local joint. It was not. Uh, but they would sell, like, the Swiss LA sauce. You get a roll. Everyone's dressed, you know, like they're in the Swiss Alps or something. And we used to go and get like, you know, like a half, you could get like a half chicken or a quarter. I'm really into food, if you can't tell. I like eating. Um, so, but yeah, that good times. I do miss, oh, I do miss all those things. So have a beef on whack and some wings for me, Tim, because I'm, Tonight. I know you, oh, now I'm getting hungry. Well, I, again, I really appreciate you doing this. And well, uh, I also want to give you the chance, Tim, this is a bit off the cuff, but uh, if you I want to give you the chance to ask people watching any question you want. If you have a question, maybe a burning question you've been wanting to ask the internet or pretty much anything, if you have anything rolling around in there, um, I want to give you the chance to ask uh, the question of the day here. Oh, um, I'm drawing a blank. I'm usually a little more clever than this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh no I'm, all right I'm, no worries i'm choking no worries well no. folks watching let no us know worries. what you let us know what you think of this interview if you liked it give us a like if you don't like give us a dislike whatever you want to do and uh, leave us a comment let us know what you think i'm jennifer moore ex tv producer and tim graham it has been an absolute pleasure talking to a buffalo man about interviewing oj simpson thank you jennifer